is from the Hebrew. Okay, please, go ahead. So he said, What shall I give you? And Jacob said, You shall not give me anything. If you will do this one thing for me, I will again pasture and keep your flock. Let me pass through your entire flock today, removing from there every speckled and spotted sheep and every black one among the lambs and the spotted and the speckled among the goats, and such shall be my wages. So my honesty will answer for me later when you come concerning my wages. Everyone that is not speckled and spotted among the goats and black among the lambs, if found with me, will be considered stolen. Okay, so he's got the flocks and he's saying, you take out right now all of the speckled and the spotted animals and all of the just regular colored ones, I will take care of. What about the black ones? And those two, take them all out. You take those off because they are more likely to produce more speckled and spotted and black ones, okay? So he's saying, you take those away from here, I'm gonna watch your flocks. Just imagine a bunch of white sheep out on the field, all right? And they're more likely to reproduce white sheep. He says, so anything after this point that is speckled and spotted or black or that is, is not a normal white sheep, that will be my wages. Okay, so he's trying to deal honestly with Laban in this by saying, just go ahead and take out everything that could produce something to your benefit now, to my benefit now, and from now on, if it does, it's mine. He says, but if you see anything that isn't speckled or spotted or black or whatever, and it's in my flocks, which will be separated, then you will say that those were stolen. Okay, so he's trying to be as honest as possible in what he's doing um, or in the way he's presenting it to Laban. I shouldn't say in what he's doing. The way he's presenting this is that, um, so I, I want to make sure you all understand this, is that here is a flock and then in there is a bunch of sheep and then there's these ones with X's are the speckled and the spotted and the black. He says, today, take these out. Put them over here in a different flock. Have somebody else take care of those sheep. All right. Now, give me all of these, all of these white ones. Put them over here. Okay. Now, this is going to be where I live, and I've got my own flock over here. All right. My children are taking care of my flock. Anytime, these are all white. These are the white ones that were taken out of here. All of these white ones, if they have a black sheep, that black sheep goes into my flock. If they're white, they stay here. But if you see a white one in this flock over here, then you'll know that I stole it or you can accuse me of stealing it and you take it back and put it in your flock. See that? That is what he's saying. Just to make it as honest as seeming as possible that if an aberrant uh, sheep is born in this flock, then it becomes mine. That is my wages. Anything that isn't normal will be mine. All right? So it's just a way of him saying, these are my wages. Anything that's born after this point, which is unlikely, is going to be mine. Okay? But he has to make money. And it does happen. You know, I mean, in Australia a, a year or two ago, or three years ago, those two white people had a black baby. That's happened two or three times in Australia. And they have checked the DNA of the mother and the father. No hanky-panky. They were born as black as could be to white parents. And it's happened several times. This does happen. It happens here. It happens there. But it's an unusual thing. Because it's unusual, he's saying, this guy, Laban, is going to say, the next verse, he's going to say, whoa, what a bargain for me, because 99.9% .9 of the sheep that are born here are going to be white, just like mom and dad. Right? Okay? So he's saying, I'm going to take really small wages from you. Go ahead. And Laban said, good, let it be according to your word. Okay, or in my version it says, oh, that it were according to your word. Excitement with an exclamation point at the end of it. He was very happy about the arrangement. Very happy. Go ahead. So he removed on that day the striped and spotted male goats and all the speckled and spotted female goats, every one with white in it and all the black ones among the sheep and gave them into the care of his sons. Okay, so that's Laban taking out all of those so that his own sons are going to take care of those so they won't be reckoned as part of Jacob's uh, the wages, okay? And he put a distance of three days from between himself and Jacob, and Jacob fed the rest of Laban's flock. To make absolutely sure that there's no stealing at night, 
anything like that, he put three days' journey between the flocks. And so Jacob is sitting there with all the white sheep out in the, the flocks, just taking care of them. Anything born after this point from white mom and white dad will be, uh, other than a white one, would be uh, Jacob's property, and it will go into his own personal flock. Anything that stays white will stay in that flock for Laban. Okay? All right, got it. Then Jacob took fresh rods of poplar and almond and plane trees and peeled white strips in them, and peeled white strips in them, exposing the white which was in the rods. And he set the rods which he had peeled in front of the flocks in the gutters, even in the watering troughs where the flocks came to drink, and they mated when they came to drink. So the flocks made it by the rods, and the flocks brought forth stripes, speckled, and spotted. Okay, so what he is doing is nobody is really, if anybody says this is absolutely the way it's going, I don't believe that they really know. There's something that he knew about husbandry that is just lost to us today. But they mate where they water. That's where they do their mating. And he's putting these rods, exposing white in the water, and something in them causes the... Uh, ones that are more prone to making speckled and spotted and whatever sheep, they mate there. The other ones don't. For whatever reason, this worked. You know, whether this was something that the Lord told him to do or if it's something that he just knew, it's like, you know, you get some fishermen, they know the, the right hole to fish at. Nobody else knows. How do you come home with all these fish every time? It's just something that he knew somehow that other people didn't, but it was to his benefit in producing the animals that were considered his. That was his wages. So he's kind of being a deceiver here. His name is being fulfilled again because he's doing something extra to benefit himself and his own family. Okay. Now, because this happens, we're going to see the repercussions of it later. And uh, it, well, we'll just go on and we'll see what happens. Go ahead. And Jacob separated the lambs and made the flocks face toward the striped, and all the black in the flock of Laban. And he put his own herds apart, and did not put them into Laban's flock. To make sure they're his, and he's just pulling out his wages, putting them out separate in his own. Okay, go ahead. Moreover, it came about, whatever the stronger of the flock were mating, whatever the stronger of the flock were mating, that Jacob would place the rods in the sight of the flock in the gutters, so that they might mate by the rods. And when the flock was feeble, he did not put them in. So the feebler were Laban's and the stronger Jacob's. Okay, so here's what he's doing is he's doing exactly what we do when we breed animals today. We want to get better and better cows, and so you will take the DNA or the, the, the sperm out of these expensive, well-bred cows, and they will use that and inject all of the, the females with the better sperm. And I, when I was in Montana last year, I met a guy that sells cow sperm. He has all of these flocks. He's got world-renowned, uh, they're the brown and white cows. What are they called? The uh, Herford. Herford, thank you. He's got the premier flock in all of the world of Herford cows, and he sells them and he doesn't make hardly enough to survive on, but from the sperm of his male Hereford cows, he makes hundreds of thousands of dollars. But this is what he was doing. He was saying, if they're healthy, I'm going to put the rods in, and the healthy ones are going to have the speckled animals. They're all going to be mine, and these puny weak ones are going to mate. They're going to have the white fox, and they're going to be Laban's. So not only is he getting more of the, the speckled and spotted, whatever, but he's getting the better quality of them as well. And uh, so... The, the big money is in the healthy flock, not just in the numbers, but in the healthy flock. Even back then, if you had a prime animal, or today, horse racing, same thing. They do the exact same thing. The prime animals will get literally up in the millions of dollars. and then, But every once in a while, you get one that came from a really runty flock, and they end up winning the, uh, the Preakness or something. So yeah. you never know. But... It is a real science, and even back then it was a science. And he, as it says in the next verse, what happened? So the man, so the man became exceedingly <coughs> prosperous, and he had large flocks, 
and female and male servants and camels. And so he didn't just get flocks. He, w he got so much that he was able to sell them for money and buy servants. He was just like his dad. He made just was very prosperous. And this is the blessing of the Lord. Whether he did it legally, whether he did it deceitfully, is irrelevant. The Lord has made an unconditional promise. Those who bless you, I will bless. Those who uh, curse you, I will curse. The Jewish people, even in their curse of the past 2,000 years, have been blessed. They've had more Nobel Prizes than anybody in the world. They've had more uh, chances of making money than anybody in the world. Culture after culture that they touch is blessed by them even when they're not in the Lord's will and because of that they suffer in their blessings rather than are blessed because of their blessings. So it's, a blessing can be a double-edged sword and in the case of the Jewish people when they're under punishment it is a double-edged sword. Their very blessings are what causes them to be punished by the people around them. They're blessed they uh, are in uh, Germany, for example. They're the proprietors. They're the people that own the businesses, and they're already getting into the scientific fields. What does Germany do? They start killing them. They kick all the scientists out to America. Thank you, uh, Germany. And uh, uh, so, but this is the blessing is the good example is America. We are blessed, and our blessing has become a curse because we have not properly used it. Do you see that? But this is, this is a picture of the smaller microcosm, which is the Jewish people. We don't know how to handle blessings, and so instead we start attributing it to ourselves, and then it turns into a curse. And that is where we're at in America right now. We've been suffering because of it. We'll continue to unless we start acknowledging who has given us the blessing. But that's all playing out in this last verse here. He's got women. He's got camels. He's got all this wealth because of the blessing of God, all right, and how he is been blessed by God. Okay, 31. 31 1. Jacob heard that Laban's sons were saying, Jacob has taken everything our father owned and has gained all this wealth from what belonged to our father. Okay, once again, we're right back to Israel. What are the Palestinians doing right now? What are the Muslims doing? The Jewish people, I talked about this on Saturday night, the Jewish people in the 1800s for for almost 2,000 years, what is the last thing they say every year at the Passover? They raise the cup and they say, next year, year. next year in Jerusalem. They have been waiting and waiting and promising that next year to their children, they're going back to Jerusalem. And finally in the 1800s, the Zionist movement started to take shape because it was time for the Lord to work in them. They went down there and they bought from the, the Turks, the Ottoman Turks who owned all of that land, exorbitant prices they pray, paid for this land that was totally useless. It was full of swamps, it was full of dysentery and malaria and typhoid, and where there weren't swamps, there was desert. There was nothing there, and I've uh, quoted uh, Innocence Abroad in one of my sermons here, but if you read Innocence Abroad, where Mark Twain went all the way through the land, the land is utterly desolate. There's just scumbags living there. Everybody is scared as they travel through the land because there's Muslim raiders, but there's really no uh, sound population there and the land is just barren. It's been cursed. And this is what Mark Twain noticed before the Zionist movement really got going. A few years later the Jews start going and they start buying this land that nobody wanted. And the Turks said, oh the stupid Jews. And they charged them all of this super high prices for land that nobody wanted. And so the Jews go in there and what do they do? They actually work for a living and they drain the swamps and they die by the thousands because of the hard work they're doing, the labor, the dysentery, the, the uh, typhoid and everything, but the swamps are being drained and now they've got the most fertile soil on the face of the earth and they plant plants. They bring in giant eucalyptus trees, actually small, but they plant them in the swamps and the eucalyptus trees drain the swamps just like we did with uh, the Florida Everglades with the, uh, the plants that we brought in, the uh, paper trees and uh, eucalyptus. Same purpose. Well, they went in there and so today you can go and you can see these massive hundred year old eucalyptus that have been just drinking up the swamps all these years. They actually used their brains and they actually worked and were willing to make the land productive again. And since they started going back Year after year, they have had a net gain of trees in that land to the point now where there are two rains instead of one in Israel. Just the way the Bible predicts, the former and latter rains would return to Israel. They now have enough rain to sustain the land, to sustain the population. They've got the fertile soil. They've got milk cows that produce more milk than American cows. 
They are at the extreme of everything they do over there. And what has happened? Exactly what happened here.